Hey, I'm back with some tips for you for the color work section of the Scandi Bloom Cowl. I hope you enjoyed today's earlier video about the provisional cast on and you found that helpful. So what's up next is some tips for you for how to manage the yarn, how to manage uh, your floats to hopefully keep your tension nice and comfortable and not too tight and, or puckery. You want to have some elasticity here. I have some tips that hopefully you'll find helpful as you work through the color work section of your lovely Scandi Bloom cowl. So the first thing I'm going to say is I suggest putting your your two different colors on each side. So I like to have my background color or my main color off on the right and my contrasting color on the left. Because I'm a right-handed knitter, normally I have my main color in my right hand and then I would have my contrasting color in my left. That's why I like to arrange the, the yarn in that way. A lot of people knit like this, where they have one color on each side, and that's fantastic. If you're able to knit like that, and you can knit Continental with one hand and English with the other, then that's fantastic. I don't do that very well. I don't hand, I don't seem to have the skill to tension the yarn very well with my left hand. And so honestly, what I do is I wrap it around like this, around my ring finger for some reason that works for me and I, I let the the contrasting yarn slide along the back to maintain the float and then when I come to a stitch where I need that I just wrap it around. That's how I do it. Now a lot of people think that's hokey and whatever but he, the main thing is when you're tensioning your yarn and making sure that your floats are the right length so you don't get anything that's puckered, the biggest determining factor of that is the spacing here. So you wanna make sure that as you're going along and you're doing your stitches, your yarn is spaced, the stitches are spaced appropriately on this side as you're carrying the float along the back. That spacing determines the length of your float, right? Does that make sense? So as you're going along, you wanna make sure that things are spaced out appropriately so that the length of your float here isn't too short. Better that it even be a little bit loose. But on the other hand, you don't want your knitting to be gappy and the fabric to be loose because you don't want to be able to see those floats from behind. So however you need to hold your yarn or tension things in order to make that happen is totally fine. People are a little snobbish and elitist about that, but I say would do whatever works for you. And if that means even that you drop this yarn and go pick up the next color and knit like normally in your right hand, then drop it, pick this one up and knit normally with your right hand, then so be it. There is such a thing in two color stranded knitting, Fair Isle, as do yarn dominance, which simply means which yarn kind of pops out more. And normally you would hold your contrasting color in your left hand if you're a right-handed knitter because then that yarn tends to pop out more. That I think is more noticeable with yarn that is not super washed and maybe not quite this, this thin and where you have more than one color of a background. Like in traditional fair isle knitting, you're only working with two colors in a row, but you do have more than two colors in the entire piece. So I think the yarn dominance is more of an issue in the traditional fair isle knitting. So it's not such a big deal here, in my opinion. I'm sure there's people that will disagree with me and that's totally fine because they're the boss of their knitting and that's great. So, to recap that briefly, you do what works best for you as far as controlling your knitting, controlling the colors and doing whatever feels best and how you're going to be able to manage as you go along. Now I'm probably messing up my, my counts here because I'm talking to you at the same time I'm trying to knit this. As long as you understand that the determining factor for the tension is the spacing here that controls the length of the float that you're carrying along behind. Now, since we're knitting in a tube, all of this is going to be actually hidden because this is going to be Kitchenered together, this provisional cast on that we have down here. And the, when we go all the way around, we're going to graph that together at the end. So you're not actually going to see any of this. So if you need to join yarn, if you run out, you need to join more. Like if you're doing the DK version or you're doing the fingering version, but you're using minis. I wouldn't get too stressed out about weaving things in because while you want them to be secure, it's going to be inside and nobody's ever going to see it. So hooray. That's another reason I like the Musselberg hat because you don't have to worry about it. You can use up scrap yarn and you don't have to worry about 
just tie a knot and carry on. The other thing I'd like to point out, and I'm, and we mentioned this a couple of times in the, the uh, vlog with Heather, but also in the swatching, is the chart is easy to keep track of because you have these vertical lines that are headed here, and you can always tell that you're on track with the chart. So these lines are always going to be this consistent color. So it's the contrasting color if you're using the chart on the left of the pattern, and it'll be the darker color if you have that flipped or you have the reverse image going on. So I really enjoy that because you always know where you are. You can also use stitch markers for the chart repeats, but I think that's really easy to keep track. So that's that's a brilliant design feature there. And it's a really good um, situation for someone who's brand new with reading charts. Speaking of which, um, I will put a link down below in the video description for how to read a chart if that's new for you. This would be a great time to learn. Okay, a couple more things I'd like to point out when we're talking about tension and floats and catching your floats is you'll notice here I've gotten to the end of a needle, which is also the end of the repeat. But one thing I want you to notice is that the last white stitch on this needle is is fourth from the end. And so when I go around the needle junction and I start knitting here, if I make a float from the white all the way across the needle junction here, that's going to cause some puckering because what, what needs to happen actually is this white yarn needs to go across the distance behind the blue stitches and then across. So if you cut off that a quarter inch and don't make it loose enough, you'll have a pucker and your tension uh, will be affected by that. So the way to, to help that is to catch your float on the very last stitch of your needle, whether that's mag whether you're magic looping or using double points or whatever, catch the float before you go around the corner or before you go across the needle junction. And the way to do that is to, I like to go in the second one before the end, take this white yarn, take your contrasting color and lay it over your working needle. Go ahead and wrap like your normal knit stitch, take that contrasting yarn back down and then complete your stitch. So what's that's done on the backside is simply bring this contrasting yarn on top of the yarn that is going to be the next stitch. So that what happens then is you'll go in and knit that next one and that traps it down and brings it right up to the right up to the end of the needle along with the main color yarn. So now I have them both right here. I make sure and do that um, almost every time at the end of an before I go around the corner or before I transfer to a new needle so that I have the proper length float when I start. Now my next stitch is the lighter color, so that's easy. And I know that I've, I'm only going across the distance of one stitch, not three stitches plus the needle junction. So I hope that makes sense and, and you find that helpful. Now the other thing that I like to do is when I know that I'm gonna have several stitches in a row, like six or seven, and I need to carry the float across the back. So I like to catch my float on the third I usually don't go more than four or five. So on since I know I have six, I'm gonna go ahead and go into the third stitch. I have six blue ones coming up, so I've done two. I'm gonna, again, bring that contrast color up and over my working needle, wrap my knit stitch, take that back down, and then draw my knit stitch through. So again, that's just bringing that float up and over the back there so that my next stitch will tack it down and then there's my yarn. So that just carries the float along. Just make sure that's nice and, and loose in the back. It doesn't have to be sloppy loose, but that's what's gonna help you carry that float across and maintain the tension. So I do that if, if there's more than, I don't like to have more than five in a row, except now because I was talking I have to tink back. But you get the idea. <laughs> I wanted to show you how I prefer to catch my floats despite the fact that I can't count and talk at the same time. So these are supposed. this is supposed to be uh, three of the contrasts to start the new bloom. So now again I have six, so I'm going to go one, two, I'm going to catch the third with my contrast, wrap my knit stitch, take that yarn back down, and then four, five, six. I just like to split the difference and do it on the third and, third and fourth stitch to tack that down. So hopefully that helps. Um, However you like to, to do, six would probably fi be fine because again, this is not something like a mitten where you're putting your hands in and we're not gonna snag it. 
it's just personal preference. I just get in the habit of doing it, you know, not going more than four or five stitches before I catch a float. Um, but the most important things is, is on this needle juncture. So I hope that makes sense. So I'll do that again when I get down to this. I'll make sure that I catch that float at the very end of this needle. Okay, I hope you found those tips helpful. If you have any questions at all, be sure to drop a comment down below, post in the Ravelry or the Facebook groups. I'd love to hear from you and I hope you're doing well. Uh, next week, rather than an instructional tutorial video, we will have a Zoom with Heather, and we'd love to see your progress. So watch for more details about that on So Happy Jane's Instagram, as well as my Instagram and newsletters. Okay, I'll see you next week.